So next in our webinar series is when to consider surgery. And today we have Dr. Charuta Joshi. She's with Children Hospital, Children's Hospital of Colorado, and she's the director of their pediatric epilepsy program. Dr. Joshi, welcome. Thank you so much, Monica. It's an honor to be able to speak to all the parents in this forum. Thank you. Great. Uh, let's talk about sort of the four categories of times when parents should start thinking about when to consider surgery. We just prepared this quick slide of the four categories, and then I thought we would jump into each one individually. Mm -hmm. um, so I think um, most parents um, know that the patient um, is not responding when the patient is not, when a child is not responding. And sometimes they just don't know when to bring up surgery because some parents either are under the impression that this has to be the absolute last resort and 20 meds have to be tried. And some other times a parent is misguided uh, by perhaps somebody that feels, because they are biased, uh, that the patient has to be treated with 20 medications and, oh, I'm going to try this one or I'm going to try that one. Um, and so if patients' seizures are drug resistant, we know from the Quan and Brody study that if a patient has failed two well-chosen medications that have been used for an appropriate length of time, that the chance that a third medication is going to make that child seizure-free, and we have definitions for these things, um, that, that, that chance is really low. Now, I will give you a caveat that in adults, that chance is lower than in pediatrics. And so we feel that in pediatrics, the chance of a third medication to, to you know, miraculously work is slightly higher than in the adult population, which is considered to be less than 5%. But in pediatric population, when that data was reanalyzed, that percentage came to somewhere between 14 and 20, but still not all that high as the first of the second Got it, okay. Yes. Um, and so I think it's important to stay on the alert um, and not just keep looking for the, for the next one or the next one or the next one. And after two to three meds at most, I think it is important to come to terms with the fact that this is not going away and something else needs to be looked at. Um, so that's drug resistance. Um, and then there is also when you know or your diagnosis is a condition that is known to be drug resistant, and there are a few of those that we can talk about. Um, there is that concept of what people used to call epileptic encephalopathy, which is now called developmental and epileptic encephalopathy, or DEE, which also one needs to consider. Um, and then sometimes when the side effects of repeated medication exposures are um, so much that the risk benefit ratio of continuously trying more is the benefit of actually just going to that next step. Got it. Let's go to this first one because it's kind of a confusing definition. So I thought we would break a, it up a little bit. And that is failure of two, sometimes three drugs. How do we piece this all out? It's a, it's a long definition. So first it has to be adequate trials. What does that mean? Um, so an ad, what is an adequate trial for a patient is um, has been discussed quite a bit at, at the level of epidemiologists, at the level of individual patients, um, at the level of the ILAE. And so um, one, the correct medication has to be chosen for the correct seizure type in the epilepsy syndrome. And a very classic example for that is if somebody has absence epilepsy and a medicine like, um, you know, oxcarbazepine or a, or a sodium channel blocker is used, the staring and you know, somehow it is felt that this is a focal seizure, then that would be the wrong medication to choose. Um, and so that would be an inadequate trial. The second issue is, let's assume that, you know, a patient is not titrated to maximum dose, either because um, either the family feels that this is a high enough dose or the physician feels that this is this is a high enough dose. And, and remember that the dose ranges or therapeutic dose ranges actually are different country to country. And sometimes that could be an issue that has actually well, been well characterized in the literature. Um, and so that could be also an issue. Um, and I don't know if you want me to go through all the rest of the, of the terms here. I'm happy to. I think you're saying you have to first make sure that the child is taking the appropriate amount of the medication. And then the second one is, can they take it? Is, is there a side effect that we don't like, right? 
Absolutely. So, you know, a classic example that comes to mind is pa that is young patients that are treated with levetiracetam. Um, we know that this is the first drug across all syndromes that uh, practitioners, you know, not just in the United States, but all over go to where it is available. And some patients have what we call the Kepra rage. And, you know, a young child suddenly becomes um, somebody that you just can't live around because they are besides themselves. They're not making this up. The parents are not making this up, and it's time to quickly move away from that medicine when it becomes dangerous uh, and somebody's so miserable on that medication. And so in that situation, the tolerance becomes a factor. So that drug then wouldn't count when you're when you're factoring in whether you failed two drugs and, for example, you tried Keppra, the child couldn't take it, then it doesn't count as one of the two drugs. That is that right? That is correct. And actually what I will actually, I, I usually use my hands and I will tell my families that I will titrate in rational therapy, a medicine to effect or to side effect. And my hand that is looking at the side effect is lower than my hand that is talking about effect, which means that in my practice, if a side effect is seen at a at not a therapeutic level, I'm still not going to subject that child to continuously increasing the dose, but because the side effect will only get worse with increasing doses and everybody needs to realize that. Got it. And then appropriately appropriately chosen and used. What does that mean? Um, so as I was referring to with absence epilepsy, we use a medicine like, like carbamazepine, which is known to worsen absence. absence. Um, or somebody has, you know, uh, seizures for which, let's assume somebody has Dravet syndrome. And we use a medicine like Lamotrigine, or we use a medicine for if they end up having, you know, myoclonic seizures, we use Vigabitrin. Um, some medications are known to worsen these children, and in those situations, it would be the, the improperly chosen medicine for that particular patient seizure type. Um, and so we want to make sure that we don't use that as a strike against them um, to say we chose one medication here. That's a tough conversation for a parent to have with a neurologist. I mean, how do we know which drug is appropriate or not? Um, I think in the world of infantile spasms, there's certainly a lot of talk in the social media groups about what is appropriate because there's so much, uh, you know, there's an active campaign to make sure that parents understand, but um, I certainly wouldn't know what's appropriate for out the bat. Um, and I'm sure most parents are like that too. So that's definitely a tricky one for a parent to kind of raise the is the issue with a neurologist. Um, mm -hmm. Then anti-epileptic drug schedules, either mm -hmm. alone or combination. Um, yeah, and so I think what this is, this is the concept of rational polypharmacy, uh, where when we are using drugs that go well together, for example, valproic acid and lamotrigine are synergistically proven to work together scientifically. Uh, that's one proof that we have. The other issue is also if I use two medicines that work through the same pathway. Uh, let's assume sodium channel blockers, like um, I use oxcarbazepine or I use trileptal, and then I put the patient on Vimpat, uh, mm -hmm. which is lecosamide. Now I'm doubling up side effects because both of them work through the same pathway. So I'm expecting the child to become very sedated, perhaps wobbly. Um, and you know, if I'm doing that for a reason, then I will explain to parents at the outset that you know I'm using two meds that work in the same pathway. So watch out, and I'd be willing to reduce the doses or to change things over relatively quickly. The one other thing that I also tell parents is that it doesn't take two months to find out if the patient has effect or side effect. If the patient has a side effect that is an idiosyncratic reaction, so to speak, you'll know right away within one to two weeks. So there's no reason to suffer for weeks and weeks at a time when somebody has side effects with non-synergistically used medications. Okay, and then the drugs have to work, right? Um, in order to establish failure, for example, you, you have to show that they didn't work. And so sustained seizure freedom is something that the literature talks about. And what's confusing to parents is for how long is the child mm -hmm. seizure free for a drug to be successful? Um, this I find confusing, so hopefully you can clarify this for our families as well. Absolutely. And so the rule of three was actually brought out, brought forth from a statistical concept. Um, and so the rule of three would be that a patient has had no seizures, including auras. And the, the concept of do I, uh, do I seize only when I drink or when I use abuse substances? 
uh, like drugs or uh, I'm non-compliant and then I have seizures, would that be considered as acceptable control? And in the realistic scientific world, the, the drugs are supposed to keep you seizure free from all your triggers. Um, and so one group of scientists feel that that situations where you know I had a sleepless night or situations where I had a clear trigger and if I have seizures they, those should still be considered as breakthrough seizures um, um, so fever related seizures for example would be one of that a good example the second concept that is very confusing is three times the longest inter seizure interval so let's assume that I am a baby and I have spasms three times a day three clusters of spasms every day. Um, and my physician gradually increases my vigabatrin dose, which is one of the drugs of uh, choice for spasm treatment. And I go from a dose of 50 milligram per kilo to 100 milligram per kilo. And where I was having three clusters a day, suddenly all clusters are gone. And so I go on three days, six days, nine days um, without any spasms. So initially, the longest interspasm duration, let's assume, was six hours. And when I reached a therapeutic dose of bigabitrin, let's say 100 milligram per kilo, now I've gone nine days. That is well over three times the longest interseizure duration. And that tells me that this is an effective duration of treatment at an effective dose. Now, let's assume I'm a patient that seizes once a year. So if I go six months without seizures on a new med, that actually doesn't mean that the new med is working and we shouldn't give false credit where it is not due. It's, it's the natural history of my seizures. And in that situation, it may take longer to declare seizure freedom. Um, however, we have used also at the same time, 12 months as an adequate seizure freedom. So for a patient that seizes once every year, ideally it would take three years to say, you really, it was really the medicine that got you seizure free and not your natural history. Uh, but for patients, now, since you and I are speaking about medical intractability, if somebody only sees once a year, we wouldn't be talking as much as we are talking today. So we, in practical uh, world, we are talking mostly about patients that are seizing much more than once a year. Um, and so if, let's assume somebody seizing once every six months, then if the patient continues to seize once every six months, they're not seizure free because they've not achieved the 12 month seizure mark. So either it is three times the maximum interseizure interval or 12 months, whichever comes first. Whichever comes first, okay. There are also these conditions that we know are more likely than not to be drug resistant off the bat. Mm -hmm. um, there's quite mm -hmm. a few of them to cover here. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think um, if, if somebody visits um, you know, Epilepsy Foundation or somebody just does a literature search or just looks up things, uh, patients that are medically intractable very frequently fall into some of these categories. Um, and we know very well in the pediatric literature that 50% of the patients that are medically intractable end up with a focal cortical dysplasia, whether or not it is seen on an MRI. Mm -hmm. um, so I would like to point out to parents that if somebody's MRI is negative, it does not mean they don't have focal cortical dysplasia because we do talk about MRI negative uh, patients. And it doesn't mean that they are lesion negative because we can have microscopic lesions that the MRI is incapable of picking up. Um, and under only it, under the microscope that tissue is shown to have focal cortical dysplasia, we have various types of it. Type one is the one that which, which you cannot see on an MRI. A condition like polymicrogyria sometimes involves um, only a certain area of the brain or sometimes both sides of the brain. And even in those situations, I think if a patient is medically resistant, it is important to ask, well, is there a non-medical therapy then that I can use? Um, I understand it's bilateral, but can I get, can I do better? Um, conditions like RE or Asmussen's encephalitis need sometimes, they have different stages of RE, where sometimes when you are in that acute stage, you're seizing, 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 and if you come to a doctor's Notice they make the diagnosis. It's easy to get you to the hibisferotomy, which is the drug of choice, or a disconnection of the bad side from the rest of the brain, because otherwise that bad side is going to have noxious effect on the good side eventually. Um, but if you are in that what we call a burnt out state, where you're not seizing that frequently, and you know um, you you are now in unfortunate situation where one side of the body doesn't work because that hemisphere has atrophied. But you continue to have, you know, seizures from time to time, you would still be a candidate, it's important to ask. Because remember, you want your child to be seizure free for 
a length of time. Um, ICs once a month is not good enough. Um, hemispheric syndromes like hemimegalencephaly, remember that um, with hemimegalencephaly, with Rasmussen encephalitis, there are some criteria that people used. Uh, for example, in Rasmussen encephalitis, there is something called Behan's criteria that people used to determine this diagnosis, but we have outliers. Um, with hemimegalencephaly, too many times we have seen situations where the bigger hemisphere is thought to be the normal hemisphere, whereas somebody's thinking that the smaller hemisphere is the atrophied hemisphere. Yeah. We uh, see so that. I'm, I'm also the administrator in the hemimegalencephaly family support network, and that's something that comes up often is that the child was incorrectly diagnosed as having an atrophied hemisphere on one side when it was really a mild HME that looked unusual to the who may not have a ton of experience with that case. Right. So. right, and I feel like, you know, parents should feel empowered. We are, we are in a world where we make we make joint decisions for patient uh, patients, and it's not like you do this because I told you so anymore. Um, mm -hmm. Parents should feel empowered to ask questions and to say, well, clearly one side looks not normal. Um, should we be looking elsewhere? Should we be thinking of thinking more out of the box here? Um, hypothalamic hamartoma is another classic, classic situation that can get missed on MRI um, if you are not thinking about it. Um, and so remember that even in a hypothalamic hamartoma situation, now, nowadays we don't have to do very invasive open surgical procedures. Uh, we can do disconnection through laser. So different surgical procedures are possible. Tuberous sclerosis is a big, big challenge because there are bilateral multifocal um, areas that need to be looked at. And then obviously others sometimes straightforward and sometimes not straightforward conditions like congenital CMV is an example of infection that can cause intractable epilepsy or pediatric stroke. Um, that that can also be patients that become drug resistant. Thank you. And then the epileptic encephalopathies, or as it's known now, the developmental and epileptic encephalopathies. And these, as I understand it, are seizures that, because of the seizures, cause severe cognitive and behavioral impairments. Yes. And so the, the concept of epileptic encephalopathy is one where my body may not be having very visible seizures, but my EEG is showing a lot of activity. And so the concept initially was that the EEG activity is eventually affecting cognition. Um, although with every spike, my family is not seeing me have a seizure. Um, and so we also now know that, that the conditions like Dravet syndrome, um, the genetic cause also causes cognitive delay, even when patients may have a relatively um, semi-controlled seizure phenomenon. So that's why it's called developmental and epileptic encephalopathy. This is a term that is actually being talked about and defined more clearly just within the last year or so. Um, and so uh, conditions like Otahara syndrome, which where patients start having seizures within the very, very first few days of birth, Drave, where these are normal kids initially, and then, you know, after having repeated fever seizures or hemiclonic status epilepticus can go on to have very, very, very difficult to treat epilepsy. Obviously, people think about epileptic spasms. This, these used to be called infantile spasms in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, now we have syndrome, one of epileptic spasms. Uh, lennox gastro syndrome, at this point in time, we consider that as a basket where, you know, a variety of causes can lead to lennox gastro syndrome. That itself, um, by itself, is not the cause of the epilepsy per se. Uh, EMAS or epilepsy with myoclonic astatic seizures is another condition that can that can be that can fit anywhere on the spectrum. If you get the correct treatment in time, you could be one of those that stops having seizures, but now we know that um, up to 30% of patients will go on and have seizures. Sturge Weber syndrome is another one where we obviously have an MRI or a CT scan lesion that is easily seen. Landau Kleffner syndrome is a classic example of where patients and parents are not talking about seizures, but no. EEG is speaking for itself. And you know, one one thing that's not on this is the is the not not the condition I want to call it the a newly recognized autoimmune we think um, epilepsy syndrome where a normal kid goes on to have status epilepticus that becomes very quickly refractory to multiple multiple meds and that's called fires. Um, it stands, it used to be called febrile infection related epilepsy syndrome. Some people prefer to call it febrile illness 
related epilepsy syndrome because sometimes we don't see a sign of infection. Wow, that's a lot. To the families out there, we're also part of the Deep Connections Initiative, which is a wonderful website, go to it, where we do quite a bit with the organization that started it, which is for Elliot, to talk about all the various issues that go along with having a child with a developmental and epileptic encephalopathy. So check that out if you have a moment. And then last but not least, this is something we really don't talk about a lot, but that is if the side effects of the medication, you might be pretty much somewhat controlled or very controlled, but the side effects outweigh the risks of surgery. Um, this is also supported in some of the literature that it's another time when you should talk about epilepsy surgery. Is that right? Yeah, I think I agree with that. Um, but at the same time, physicians also have to balance um, their thought process with respect to families that don't want medications at all um, and want to go straight to surgery. And so depending on every hospital rule, depending on every physician's um, own internal compass in terms of, you know, can I, can I risk, because seizure surgery also comes with its own risks. And so then as, as it's rightly said here, um, does, do you have to prove that medications are causing risk before you will take the patient to surgery? Or how do you balance patient um, desire where they don't even want to take a chance with medications and go straight to surgery? And that becomes a toss up. And I think if you have a good relationship with your physician, you can get there um, where no physician in their right mind wants the child to suffer through side effects. And what I say is, the, the goal is important. Getting you to epilepsy slash seizure freedom is what is most important. Um, on that way there, we want to keep the child as healthy and as being able to lead a fruitful life as possible. Um, and so this constant discussion is important to be had. The relationship is so important. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you joining us today. This was a great webinar for our families. And I hope you'll come back for uh, another webinar in the future where we can talk about something else that's important to the community we serve. No, this is a great honor. Thank you very, very much. Anything I can do to help. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we're joined by Catherine Flynn, who is a parent on our Community Advisory Council. And she's going to share with us part of her parent uh, having a child who had drug resistant seizures and when they started to get first. Catherine, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So tell me about your daughter's epilepsy. So my daughter was diagnosed with febrile seizures when she turned, um, well, we were, she was almost turning three. And um, we were told, you know, oh, this is so common. Don't worry about it. She's neurotypical. She's hitting all her milestones. Um, she's doing great. You'll probably never have another seizure again. So fast forward for us, um, she went on to have several other febrile seizures with illness, fitting that same profile until one day she had a non-febrile seizure. Mm -hmm. At that point, at this point, we still had a negative MRI, we still had a negative EEG, and we were still kind of on this path of she's gonna grow out of this, right? She's gonna, you know, she's not gonna be in that 25% that go on to have epilepsy as a diagnosis. Would she have a seizure every time she got a fever? Um, pretty much when she first started the journey. Uh, and then, you know, we obviously started medication after we went on to have, you know, our second and third seizure. We, we put her on medication, which we were very hesitant to do. That was definitely a hard decision for us as a family to put her on medication because she was, you know, thriving and doing so well. Um, and as we know, medication can also cause cognitive deficits and cause just as many side effects as, you know, as the seizures. So it's the lesser of two evils, in my opinion. Yeah. So she started having seizures that were non-febrile. What did you do then? So then, um, you know, to be honest with you, and I think a lot of parents are in this boat, you go to your neurologist because your pediatrician then says, okay, you need to go to a specialist. So you need to find a neurologist. Well, at this point, epilepsy was never even in our family. I mean, I had a friend in college who had epilepsy, but it was something that never really crossed my mind as something that I would be dealing with in my own family. Yeah. And so at that point, you know, 
you, you know what a neurologist is and they are a catch-all and they you know have um, a lot of different expertise and most of them do treat seizures but i had never heard of an epileptologist before and so, you know, when you're a parent and you're going through all of these different things, um, you know, with your children, you start Googling, you start asking people, um, you know, and epilepsy is definitely one of those things I was hesitant to share with people because it was such a, you know, strange disease for, for our family just because we weren't used to talking about that. And it does have such a stigma to, like a, a stigma behind it. So, you know, kind of getting to that point too was a big step for me as a parent. So we found an epileptologist, um, you know, and I felt much better being in a place where I was dealing with someone who only treats seizures and epilepsy. And through our journey, let's see, she was diagnosed when she was almost three and then had her surgery at six. But through our journey, um, you know, the negative MRI, you know, quickly turned positive. And so we kind of thought, there's something interesting here now. Now we've got something to talk about. Um, and what my daughter had was a known condition called measles temporal sclerosis. It's very common in epilepsy, in focal epilepsy. And it's funny because the epileptologist, in a way, they feel like they found something, right? Like, okay, maybe maybe there's a chance that we can we can fix this. So we. Failed two drugs. Um, we failed two drugs. One, we had the Kepra Rage, which I know the doctor spoke about earlier. Um, another one we failed because my daughter had dress syndrome with Trileptol, which caused put us in the hospital and caused more seizures because she had an allergic reaction, a very oh common allergic reaction to that drug. So at that point, I had just had it with the drugs. And in fact, I actually kept her off medication for about six months. Um, and, and she didn't have a seizure. I mean, in my case, my daughter didn't seize a lot. She would seize once or twice a year, but when she would have a seizure, it wouldn't stop. Oh we were my God. I mean, you know, half an hour here, an hour there. I mean, it's always ER, always pumping drugs, rescue meds. So I had just had enough. <laughs> and knowing the risks of SUDEP and knowing the risks that, you know, my daughter would have, I just really wanted her to have the best chance at a normal existence that she could have. So um, we ventured up, we, we ended up um, becoming patients at Boston Children's Hospital. And um, it's at that point that I found a really great partnership with the doctor there. And we just started having open conversations about, you know, he felt strongly this surgery is not a last resort. And he felt very strongly that, especially with Margaret's diagnosis, my daughter's name is Margaret, um, she had a pretty good chance of coming out of this and being seizure free or maybe not going into status for hours and hours and hours. So surgery is an extremely, extremely uncomfortable thing as a parent to talk about. Um, and actually the way I even found the Doctors of Austin Children's was the laser surgery that is kind of a newer thing, um, I believe was originally designed for what my daughter had, the measles templar sclerosis, um, and has worked quite well. We did a full open surgery. Um, that was just a decision that we made with our doctors because we felt like for us, we could get a lot more information doing that with pathology. And there were some other benefits to it. And, and knowing that we could always go back in the end and do a laser kind of touch up or something if we needed to do that. Yeah. Wow. But, just it, just this, the journey we go on as parents, it's, it's, it's crazy at the end of the day. It's really so challenging and that you had to go outside of in Louisiana, right? Yes, I did. I did. Um, I did. And, you know, I will say as, as a parent, you know, you are your child's advocate and you really do have choices. You have choices of doctors and there are, if, if one doctor you know, doesn't really see things your way, I highly recommend getting second and third opinions. I think that is something that you should be empowered to do as a parent. Um, I also would highly recommend if anyone has not um, at this point seen an epileptologist, um, I definitely highly recommend that. They just have so much information under their belt, statistical information. Um, they've had a patient like yours, most likely, you know, or something similar. So um, 
you know, I just think like anyone would tell you who's had a child who's gone through surgery successfully, they would they wish they would have done it sooner. Yeah, I, I think that's, I mean, certainly it's not something to consider lightly. It's, it's terrible that surgeries are reversible, but um, absolutely. We believe that parents should have as early as possible and then make an informed healthcare decision. No. Um, yeah. I was kind of unaware of what other parents went on because my son's brain inflammation was massive. And we knew by the time he was four days old, he would have to have half his brain removed. And it happened right. pretty quickly. But there are others of you who, wow, it, it's three years for you uh, before surgery was on the table. And that's a long time. It, it is. It is. It's, it's a lot of lost time and a lot of, I mean, as, as a parent of someone with epilepsy who would have seizures in her sleep, you know, and prolonged seizures in her sleep. I mean, I don't, I mean, I don't think it was until after surgery that I actually slept an entire night soundly. Yeah. And that's just because I feel like at this point, I've done all I can do. And she's still on, she's on one medication, she's on a low dose. And I, you know, I really do hope that at some point in her life, she can become medication free. Um, that's not our plan right now. But still, I feel like we're in a much better place today than we were three years ago. And what I will say too, to parents, um, the surgery journey is not an easy one. There's definitely different phases of testing and different things that your child has to go through. But here's the good news. If you decide that you wanna start going through that process, you don't have to go through the surgery. It's ultimately your decision. But what I will tell you is you will receive so much information about your child's condition just going through that process. So I just wanted to say, you know, for parents out there who are so on the fence, because it is scary. It is not an easy decision. It is one that, I mean, you know, still to this day, you know, I know I made the right choice, but every day I think, you know, could the seizures come back? Absolutely they could. I mean, nothing is 100%. But I just would say, you know, go through the, if you have the opportunity and your child is a candidate for surgery, I would highly recommend going through the process because even if you decide not to do it, you have so much more information and it just gives you power. Information is power, you know, it's true. It truly is. It is. So. It is. Thank you so much for sharing your journey with our families and thank you for the work Absolutely. that you do our Community Advisory Council. I couldn't do it without you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me.